Last week, if you were here or watched online, you heard uh, one of the stats. We, we had some celebrations, and one of the stats Kyle shared was that I preached the longest sermon in 2022. And so my New Year's resolution is to preach shorter sermons. Okay, that's just for you. Uh, so we're going to dive right in today, okay? Uh, if you have a Bible, open up to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, and just hold that spot. We're going to come back to that. 504 years ago, in the year uh, 1519, a guy named Hernando Cortez set sail from Spain with 500 soldiers, 100 crew, and 11 ships. They were bound for the new world and they had one goal in mind and the goal was gold. They just wanted to find as much of it as they could. They knew they'd have to send a whole bunch back to Spain, but obviously the motivation to be rich and you know, powerful like that, that was there. And, and, and so they were just, they, they went for gold, right? They landed at Yucatan and, and almost from the minute their feet hit the ground, the challenges started to build and they knew there would be challenges. For example, they knew winter was coming and that wouldn't be easy. They knew there would be sicknesses. They knew they were gonna have to figure out how to eat and, and provide and establish a community because the food for their voyage would only last so long. And so they knew, you know, we're gonna have to figure that out. But they knew more than anything that the greatest challenge they would face would be the Aztecs who had been in the land for more than 600 years. They were a dominant force and they weren't gonna let the gold go freely. Well, almost immediately, these challenges started to demoralize Cortez's crew, right? And so uh, it wasn't very long until this plan, this plot to mutiny started to spin up. And the, the thing was, okay, we're going to kill Cortez, we're going to steal the ships, and we're going to sail to Cuba, where it's a little safer than it is here. Well, word of this plot gets to Cortez, and so the next morning, he gets everybody out on the shore. He calls them all together, and he says, man, I've, I've heard this plot that's going around right now. And so... Here's what I want you to do this morning. Burn the ships. Burn the ships. Now, I'm not endorsing what Cortez did after his men established their community because what they did to the Aztecs was horrible. It was absolutely terrible. But I think we can learn lessons from people, even people who've done terrible things. And the principle I think we can learn from Cortez today is this, is that Retreat is easy, even inevitable, when you keep an open option. It reminds me of a story of another guy that maybe you've heard of. He's like this, uh, this guy from this backwater town called Galilee. His name's Simon. You know him as Peter. One day he's out on a boat with his brother Andrew. They're fishing. They're throwing their nets in the water. You know, this is how they made their living. And, and uh, as they're out on the water... This new teacher in town, this guy, he's kind of new on the scene. He shows up on the shore and he calls out to Peter and his brother on the boat. And he says, hey guys, drop your nets and come with me. This guy named Jesus. And Peter has a decision to make. Am, am I going to go? Am I going to leave my, my career behind? Am I going to like, this is how I make a living. Am, am I going to walk away from that just to follow this, this guy that I really don't know all that much about, just what I've maybe heard. But he does for whatever reason. Now fast forward a little bit, okay, to John chapter six, and um, Jesus has just performed his most famous miracle. It's the only miracle that we see in all four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He's teaching one day on a hillside and this crowd gathers. Thousands and thousands of people. We know this because they counted. <laughs> and they didn't count people, they counted heads of households and there were 5,000 of them. So I don't know, maybe, maybe 12, 15, 20,000 people or more gathered on this hillside this day. And Jesus teaches all day long and these people are out in the sun and eventually they start to get hungry. And so Jesus' disciples come to him and they say, Jesus, these people are hungry. The crowd's getting a little rowdy. You know, it's Sunday and Chick-fil-A's closed. So what are we gonna do? <laughs> and Jesus says, oh, well, you feed them. And the disciples scratch their heads and they, well, we don't. <laughs> have this kind of food and we don't even have money to buy this food for this many people. That's crazy. And the grocery store shelves aren't that deep. Uh, we don't know what to do, Jesus. And he says, all right, go out in the crowd, just find what you can find and bring it to me. And so they find this little boy who brought a sack lunch, right? His G.I. Joe lunchbox. Got some bread and some fish in there and they bring him to Jesus. And, and, and maybe you know the story. Jesus, in a miraculous way that only Jesus could do, takes the bread and takes the fish and multiplies it and feeds Everybody, to the extent where they were all satisfied and there were bucketfuls and bucketfuls and bucketfuls of food left. It was absolutely a miracle. So then the crowd goes home and the next day they come back looking for Jesus. They, they might have wanted Jesus more than likely the, the food was good and they wanted lunch. 
But Jesus is gone, right? The night before, he and his disciples, they take off, they sail across the lake over to the other side. Jesus was always doing this, trying to find a few moments of peace away from the madness of the crowds. But the people, they're they're determined. And so they travel around the lake and they find Jesus. They search him out and they, they locate him and they're looking for another meal. But Jesus, this time, when he sees the crowd, decides, I'm not gonna feed him with more food. I'm gonna feed him with the word of God. And then he preached, guys, what I think might be Jesus' worst sermon he ever preached. And before you label me a heretic, let me explain a little bit. You see, I already told you, you started out this day with this crowd, right? Well, if there were 5,000 heads of household the day before, imagine how many there must be the next day because all those people would have gone home and told all their friends, man, you should have been there. The food was incredible. You, the guy, he was a little sketchy, but the food was great. You gotta come back tomorrow and try some of this stuff, right? So I can only imagine it's all those people and all their friends, and they're like, you should have seen it. Somehow the bread just kept like showing up. He just kept reaching in the bucket. There was more and more and more. Like, you have to check it out, right? Great magic show. So all these people show up expecting a meal. And I say it's Jesus' worst sermon ever because when he got to the end of it, there were 12 left. Not 12 families, 12 men. Here's why. When you look at John chapter six, and you don't have to turn there, I'm just gonna tell you what it says. Verse 53, this was the main point of the sermon, okay? So put yourself in their shoes. You show up to church and and this is the main point. Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. You coming back to church next Sunday? People are like, okay, now we're talking about ritual cannibalism? I'm out. Is it any wonder that the crowd dispersed? I mean, this is weird, but let me tell you guys something. Jesus was not talking about flesh and blood. What he's talking about is absolute loyalty, Jesus is saying, look, I need to be your only source. I don't want to be number one. I want to be the only one. And so it's not about flesh and blood. It's about, is Jesus your only one? And does he have your absolute loyalty? Well, in verse 60, the people say, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And then they all go their separate ways. Verse 66 says, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Worst sermon ever, right? Nobody broke up a crowd quite like Jesus. And so he looks at these 12 guys who are left and he says, guys, you uh, you don't want to leave me too, do you? Now, Peter, who is not known for his bravery, I mean, this is his moment. Because if he wants an exit plan, guys, this is it, right? Thousands of people leaving in every direction and all Peter had to do was like slip into the crowd and just kind of wander away and never be heard from again. So this is his chance. If he wants out, if this Jesus thing is a little too weird, maybe he misses the boat, maybe he's afraid. I I don't know, but like if he wants an exit strategy, here it is. And once again, he's faced with the decision to make. And again, Peter, who... Is not known for, for coming through courageously in, in tough moments. He, he has a moment of genius. This is what he says to Jesus. Here's his reply. Ready? Jesus says, you don't want to leave me too, do you? And Peter says, Lord, where would we go? To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. I mean, this is Peter's burn the ships moment. Now, let me tell you something. Like, just like Peter, you and, and me, we're gonna have a moment. We're gonna have a day where we're faced with this decision. Okay, am I going all in? I've played around long enough. I, I show up to church once in a while, but if I'm honest, it doesn't mean all that much to me. Or, or I, you know, like I just haven't taken my faith seriously. And so it's not really like something that I can lean on or, or whatever the case may be for you. Like we're all gonna have a moment where we're faced with this decision to make and it's your burn the ships moment. What are you gonna do with Jesus? Are you gonna go all in? Is he gonna be your only one? And let me tell you, following Jesus isn't easy. If you've been following him any time at all, you know that's true. If you're not following him yet and you're here today or you're watching online or you're listening from somewhere else, maybe later, I just want you to know, following Jesus does not solve all your problems. Even Jesus said, in this life you'll have trouble. 
He wanted us to know it. He did not want anybody to be bait and switched or tricked into thinking that you make some decision, you get in the water, whatever happens, and all of a sudden all your problems go away. Jesus wanted us to know actually the opposite can be expected. And so it's not easy, but guys, retreat is easy, even inevitable, if you keep an open option. Now, the key to success with this is you've got to develop some things in your life. You've got to develop some spiritual rhythms, some habits, some disciplines in your life that are going to make you steady and make you firm in your faith. You've got to develop some, some habits and some rhythms and some disciplines, some things that you do in your life, not occasionally, but regularly, like all the time, okay? And you've got to do this because when hard times come, you're going to be tempted to look every way but straight. And it's so easy to retreat in the hardest moments if your faith is not rooted and anchored in Jesus. And I'm not talking about New Year's resolutions, okay? Because we all make those, but the average resolution lasts two and a half weeks, so you say, I want to lose weight, but you go home and you got snacks all over the counter, right? Or you say, I want to be more productive. I don't want to be so lazy. But then you got to log out of Netflix and cancel your subscription. I don't want to be so angry, but then you drive through Belden Village at lunchtime. <laughs> Whatever. Resolutions are great in theory, but man, they hardly mean anything. And I'm not, I want you to know I'm not talking about resolutions. I'm talking about commitments, I'm talking about habits. A habit is continued success in the same direction. So it's saying, I'm not only gonna do this once, I'm not even gonna do it a few times, I'm gonna do it every single time until it becomes a pattern in my life that's almost just on autopilot, right? I shared this in a sermon series months and months ago, but I wanna share it again with you today because you can apply this principle to anything in your life. Here it is, it's really simple. Successful people do consistently what others do occasionally. So if there's something in your life, maybe it's in your spiritual life, maybe it's in your personal life, maybe it's in your professional life, you're a, a manager or a small business owner, or you lead people, whatever it is, if you wanna be successful at something, you need to do consistently what less successful people are only willing to do occasionally. And that principle is certainly true in your spiritual life when it comes to growing your faith. If you want it to grow and you want it to be meaningful, then you have to do consistently Maybe what you've only done occasionally up to this point. That's how you make a new habit an old habit. And that's the idea, okay? And so that's the thesis of the series. It's that this, it's that you and I, we are not defined by a few huge moments in our lives. The world would want you to believe that. People would want you to believe that. You make one dumb mistake or you make one bad decision or you do one thing that you can't undo and that defines you. But I'm here to tell you that's not true. Actually, you are the sum of all the small decisions that you make and all the little areas where you choose to be faithful or not throughout your life. And so the question is, what will you choose? Over the next few weeks, we're gonna talk about a lot of these habits, but I just want you to know they require time, they require intentionality, and they require commitment. I don't want you to think these are easy things to do. But here's why we're preaching this anyway, okay? Because there are... It's easy to get up here and preach fun stuff or easy stuff. And I've said before, man, if I would do that, you would not be able to find an open seat in this room because people love to hear the good stuff. They love to hear the easy stuff. They love to hear the fun stuff. You start talking about hard things, just like Jesus did, it's easy for people to not wanna hear that. And so here's why I'm gonna stand up here and Brian's gonna get up here next week. This is why we're gonna preach this stuff to you. It's because it matters. It's because it matters and things that really matter often are not easy. They require time and intentionality and commitment. And I want you to know that as you process this stuff and as you consider these commitments, Satan is going to do everything he can to blow this up for you, okay? He's going to do everything he can to try to distract you. He's going to do everything he can to try to get you to take your eyes off the goal. He's going to do everything he can to try to discourage you. And so here's what I want you to do starting now and through this series is I want you to ask this question, what ship do I need to burn? Maybe it's the ship of excuses. Maybe you've had excuses for why you haven't been more active in the life of your church family. Maybe you've got excuses for why you haven't read your Bible a little more. Maybe you have excuses for why you've done this or that or something else. You know, I'm just so busy or, you know, that's, it's, it just takes so much of my attention or whatever it is. I don't know. You know your excuses. I don't. But maybe that's the ship you need to burn. Maybe the ship you need to burn is Negativity. 
Maybe you've surrounded yourself with some negative people and, and now their negativity is bleeding into your life and it's taking root in your heart and you can see yourself becoming more negative and more pessimistic in the culture that we live in. That is easy to do. And so maybe what you need to do is maybe you need to identify those negative people in your life and you need to burn that ship, okay? Do not light anybody on fire. I don't want Facebook to censor me. I told somebody, this is a true story. I told somebody a few weeks ago, um, or like a few months ago, a friend of mine uh, who's on staff, Tim, he'd had a surgery and he was riding one of those scooters through Walmart and he talked about how people kept walking in front of him. And all I did was comment on his thing, mow him down and Facebook flagged my account, okay? <laughs> Seriously, I'm still on suspension. So I have to watch what I say. So don't let anybody on fire. When I say burn the ship, I mean maybe you need some distance in that relationship, okay? Let's just clarify. There's some people out there who take some things a little too literally, all right? Maybe the ship you need to burn is control. Maybe you're like me and there are some things in your life that matter to you and you don't wanna trust anybody else with those things. And so it's, it sounds way better for you to say, I'm just gonna control it. I'm gonna hold on to it. And the shift you need to burn is control. And once and for all, you just need to say, Jesus, you're wiser than me. You're more powerful than me. You love me better than I love myself and you love the people in my life better than I could love them. So I trust you with this stuff. Maybe that's the ship you need to burn. Maybe it's conflict. Maybe there's something between you and somebody and you're holding a grudge. You've been carrying for a while. Maybe they did something that hurt you. Maybe it wasn't anything that was that big a deal, but they just haven't apologized and that just drives you crazy. I don't know what it is. But can I tell you something? If things aren't right between you and somebody else, things will not be right between you and Jesus. And so maybe there's some conflict you need to resolve and you need to go and ask for forgiveness or offer it, maybe even to somebody who doesn't know they need to ask you. Maybe there's conflict and that's the ship you need to burn. I, I don't know, but I, I will tell you this. Whatever that ship is for you, I wanna challenge you to consider this and I want you to name it because you can't defeat what you don't define. So what's the ship you need to burn? Name it. My prayer for this series is your faith is gonna be a little stronger, a little bolder, it's gonna mean a little more in your life in 2023 than it did in 2022. I've been praying for that for you. I'm gonna keep praying for that for you. And let me just say this. If you're somebody who's not following Jesus yet, please don't tune me out, okay? What's gonna happen for you in this series is you're gonna get a better idea of what doing life with Jesus should look like so that if you decide you wanna follow him, and I hope you will, then you'll know what it looks like and, and you won't come into it and expect one thing and get another, but you're gonna have a realistic set of expectations for how to invest in your faith so that it is meaningful in your life. So, so don't tune me out. And at the very least, maybe at the end of this, you'll have a better idea why some of your Christian friends are so weird sometimes. I don't know what that would be, okay? And here's where it starts. The very first discipline we need to develop in our lives, what, this is like Jesus 101, ground floor, is this, you've got to spend time with him. My youth pastor, when I was growing up, he called this hang time with God. It's kind of a cheesy way to put it maybe, but the idea is this, are you spending any time one-on-one -on -one with Jesus? Can I tell you why that matters? It's because you become the five people that you spend most of your time with. My wife just posted that on Facebook a few weeks ago, it's true. If you look at the five people that you surround yourself with most often, you start to become like them. And so if you surround yourself with negative people, you're gonna become a little more negative. But if you surround yourself with positive people, you, you'll start to become a little more positive. If you wanna be successful in some area, you need to find people who've been successful in that area and get around them or read their books or listen to their podcasts or have coffee with them. Whatever the case may be, you need to spend time with those people because you become the five people you spend the most time with. Now, Time out, here's a no-brainer for you, but check this out. If you wanna be like Jesus, you need to spend time with him. That's what Paul was talking about in Philippians chapter two. If you have those verses open, let's look at those, okay? Here's what's going on. Paul wrote the book of Philippians to a church in Philippi that he helped start, but as he did, he traveled. And so he would start a church and then move somewhere else and start a church and move somewhere else. And so he started this church in Philippi with some believers there and, and um, then he moved on. And so he's writing this letter back to the church to give them some instruction. And here's what he tells them in Philippians chapter two, verses 12 and 13 that help us understand the importance of personal time with Jesus. This is what Paul says. Therefore, my dear friends, 
As you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. Remember that part, Paul's not with them anymore. He says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Paul's saying, hey, when I was there with you, you did great, but I'm not there anymore. So I can't be the one to hold you accountable. And I can't hold your hand through this. And I can't walk with you every step of the way. So it's even more important that you stay focused on following Jesus and being obedient to his way. Because I'm not there to do it for you guys. Now, why does this matter for you? Let me tell you another story that will explain. I heard a preacher one time share a story that he had uh, toured in Orange Grove in Florida. And uh, at the end of the tour, there was a restaurant. He and his wife stopped to eat. And so they're sitting down over brunch and he ordered orange juice because you're in Florida on an Orange Grove, right? You get orange juice. So they place their order. And a minute later, the server comes back to the table and says, "Uh, sir, I'm sorry, but I can't get you orange juice because they just told me our machine is broken in the back. He said, I looked out the window and all I could see, as far as I could see, were just orange trees covered in oranges, ready to be picked. I could have gone outside, I could have picked a few oranges and squeezed them into my glass myself and had a cup of orange juice in like five minutes. But the server's telling me I can't have any because the Minute Maid machine's busted. Now that sounds crazy, but can I tell you that that's how a lot of Christians approach their faith in Jesus? Because you're surrounded by opportunities to grow. Every day is full of them. You're surrounded by moments that you can spend with Jesus investing in your faith intentionally. But yet so many people, the only spiritual input they have is a few minutes on Sunday morning. For so many people, or or let me go even further, okay? Because here's something I want you to know about your spiritual life. Your faith was meant to grow. Imagine this, imagine that my wife Ashley and I, right? We get married and and we go on our honeymoon. We come home, we get into our house and we go to our separate bedrooms. And, uh, and we, you know, we might text each other once in a while, but we don't see each other. She has a work schedule. I have a work schedule, kind of do our own thing. In fact, let's just say, you know, we only see each other like a couple times a year. What's that marriage look like? And again, that's how some of us approach our faith in Jesus because I mean, there are people like, I, I'm a preacher's kid growing up, so sorry if this name offends you, but we used to call those people creasters. You show up on Christmas and Easter, we don't see you all year long, right? What kind of relationship is that? Man, if that's your marriage, that marriage is gonna fall apart in no time, but yet what would make you think that a relationship with Jesus would be sustained by, by that level of dedication? You see, it, it, it takes time. And that's what Paul is trying to tell the church in Philippi in these verses. And that's what he would want you to know today, that if you want your faith to grow, it requires time and focus and a, like attention and, and, and intentionality. It requires all those things. I also want you to know that Spiritual growth is a lifelong journey. It is not something that you do and and then it's just done, right? Uh, I've told you before about my great grandma. Her name was Hilda. She died years and years and years ago. Uh, But when I was in college, I would go visit her on my breaks toward the end of her life. And and she's like 90, 91 years old and she's in a bed. She can't even get out. But you know what she would wanna do every single time I'd go visit her? She just wanna tell me something new. She learned about Jesus reading her Bible and she'd been following him since she was like a little girl. So that inspires me because it's a lifelong journey. It never stops. You know when it's gonna end? There's a verse in the Bible that says, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. And it will be completed on the day your heart stops beating and you stand before Jesus and he makes you new. But until then, we just keep growing and growing and growing. And the goal is tomorrow, I wanna look a little bit less like me and a little bit more like him. And then the next day, I wanna look a little less like me and a little more like him. And the next day, a little less like me and a little more like him. That's the goal. And it's a lifelong journey. If you've been on a journey, you know it's not a short trip, right? It's a, it's a long thing. It's something that you engage in, you're into it for a little while. And that's your spiritual growth. It is a journey. It's a journey. When you spend time with God, though, some really cool things happen. Like this in Psalm chapter 51, verses 9 and 10, we read these words that David wrote. He said, Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a what? Let's try one more time. All right, louder than that. You can do better. Creating me a what? 
Oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. When you spend time with Jesus, he changes your heart. And the more time you spend with him, you know what I've found is uh, somehow something inside of you changes and this desire to live your way just kind of softens. And just like David wrote in these verses when he's like, he's begging God, please don't see my stains. Please don't look at me and think of that stuff, but God, create a clean heart in me. The more time you spend with Jesus, the more you're gonna just want that. That might even sound weird to you right now, but the more time that you spend with him, you'll find that to be true. He changes your heart. He also gives you direction for living. Psalm 119 says, I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. It literally illuminates the steps to take. So if you're trying to figure out how to restore a relationship, there is wisdom for you in God's word. If you're trying to figure out how to handle a tough situation in your life, there is wisdom for you in God's word. It's a lamp for your feet and a light for your path. It's to help guide you. And God will speak to you in his word. And even in this way, when you spend time with God, he's with you in your toughest moments. 2 Corinthians 1.4 says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. I don't know if you're picking up on a theme in these verses, but it's comfort. Now, can I tell you how he does, how he does this? I think, I think it's in two ways. And I've seen them both this past week firsthand. I saw it yesterday as I sat right over there and I listened to Monica Peters stand in this spot and tell a room packed full of people about the toughest day of her life. A little over a week ago when she lost her husband in a tragic accident. And she got the news at about two in the morning and the six hours between that trooper showing up at her front door And her three boys waking up. How do you even <laughs> handle that, right? But, but man, she stood right here and she talked about what got her through that moment. And it was a promise from God in his word where he just says, I'll be with her at the break of day. Like that's the psalm she turned to. You want to tell me God doesn't speak through his word anymore? Come on. And can I tell you, when you are in your hardest moment, God will do that for you. And you know how else he shows up? And man, I've seen it all week as he shows up in his people. There is nothing cooler than seeing the church be the church. There's nothing cooler than seeing people show up for each other, not just in good times, not just when we're hanging out and spending time together, but man, when life just falls apart and and it's like, who's gonna be there for me? Guess what? You're in a room full of them. I saw it, guys, and it's incredible. When you spend time with Jesus, like that's what you get. You get comfort in the hardest moments when, when everything falls apart. He is with you in your hardest moments moments. And I could keep going like this list is long, but the point is when you spend time with Jesus, things in your life change and they get better. They get better. So what do you do with this? Here's what you do with this, okay? The first thing you've got to do is you have to make this a priority. It can't just be a thing you do. It has to be the thing you do. I've told people before, if you're going to spend time with Jesus, find the point in your day where it's like you're at your best and you can get in the zone and you can spend time with Jesus. No, scratch that. Here's what you do. When you wake up in the morning, before your feet hit the floor, you open your Bible and you spend time with Jesus. Because when you do, it will change your frame of mind for your day and it will make your day better. It will give you perspective on the things that are gonna happen to you that you don't even know about yet. So spend time with Jesus before your day even starts. You gotta make it a priority and you gotta take the time. You can't make it because you only get so many minutes in your day and no matter what you do, it's the only resource you can't make more of. If you want more money, you go get a second job or a third job or whatever you gotta do. You can make more of that. You can't make more time. 
Okay, you get the same number of minutes no matter how you slice it. And so you can't make it, you gotta take it. If that means you take it from somewhere else so you can spend it with Jesus, then rob anything because this matters more. It's not for me, it's for you. It matters more. Take the time regularly. I told you earlier, successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. You wanna have a faith that's successful and that lasts through hard times? There it is. You gotta make it a habit. Do it regularly. Here's what I wanna challenge you to do. Take five minutes. If you're spending no time in an average day in God's word and in prayer, start with five minutes. Or if you're spending like five minutes a day, make it 10. Or if you're spending 15 minutes a day, make it 20. Whatever it is, step it up five minutes this year and see what happens. Now, five minutes might not seem like that big a deal, but can I tell you why it is? Let me show you a picture. Check this out. This is just a little piece of wood. It looks huge on the screen, but it's actually only a couple inches long. Okay, just a tiny little piece of wood. How much would you pay for this? Probably not much. If you went to Home Depot and you saw that thing laying on the floor, you'd assume it busted off of some other piece of wood, right? You wouldn't pay anything for that. But what if I told you that that piece of wood just sold at an auction for $275,000? Here's why. That piece of wood was actually part of the propeller from the Wright Brothers airplane that flew in the Outer Banks in 1903. And then a guy that you might've heard of named Neil Armstrong borrowed it from the Smithsonian and took it to the moon with him on Apollo 11. So it's been around a little bit. Here's why I show you this, because something that's small and seemingly insignificant can be extremely valuable in the right context. Now, five minutes in your day might not seem like a big deal, and maybe you hear me say that and you think, it's just five minutes, how much good could that do me? Prove me wrong. Try it and see. What do you have to lose? Give it five minutes. Here's how you do it. You pray. It's this easy. It's, it's Jesus Whatever I'm gonna read in a minute, help me understand it and give me wisdom to apply it to my life. Amen. And then you read it, okay? Whatever it is. I, I always tell people this, when you're starting out, don't read a verse, read a passage. If you read a verse, it's too easy to take it out of context or make it mean things it's not supposed to mean. Pick a little passage, read it, okay? And then at the end, you just pray. God, what I just read, again, give me wisdom to apply it to my life today. Done, okay? Five minutes, see what happens. To help make this easy for you, we put together a PDF that you can download right now on hub.firstchristian.com. Hub.firstchristian.com. It's a 21-day prayer and Bible study guide that'll just help you get going. And here's my challenge. If you doubt what I'm telling you this morning, commit to 21 days and see what God does. And see at the end of it if your faith doesn't feel stronger. And see at the end of it if you haven't heard from him in a new way. Okay? Five minutes a day, guys. Something seemingly small and insignificant can mean a whole lot in the right context. Now, we're just getting going. Next week, we're gonna continue in this series because there are other habits and rhythms we need to develop in our lives so that our faith will be strong and anchor us in hard times. But it starts with this. And so I'll just ask you one more time. What ship do you need to burn to be able to commit to this? And then are you willing to give it five minutes? The time that you spend with Jesus will be transformational in your life if you will make it a habit. Now, speaking of time with Jesus, we're gonna go into a time of communion right now. If you have the communion elements, go ahead and get those ready. I hope somebody handed you some on your way in the door. I'm gonna pray in a minute and then we'll give you a minute to take communion, so just hang on to it. This is a time in our service where we just thank God for what he's done for us. Now, what you're doing now and in the next few minutes, this is literally what time with God looks like. It's just taking a few minutes of silence one-on-one -on -one with Jesus, okay? And so in this moment, you know, we typically tell you, thank him for the cross, thank him for the empty tomb, thank him for grace, thank him for mercy. Maybe today, the thing that you do in this moment is you just spend time with him, thanking him for what he did for you and then asking him to give you the dedication and the perseverance to honor that by just spending a little time with him this year in your day. Maybe it starts for you in this moment right now. Here's what I do know though, as we take these elements, the reason we do this, the reason we take communion, the reason we spend time with Jesus, the reason we worship him, the reason we do all this is because thousands of years ago, a guy who you, uh, you've never seen his face, face to face, but you will one day, 
And he loved you so much that long ago before anybody ever thought of you that he got on a cross and he died for you because the sin in your life and the sin in my life created a debt that we can't afford to pay. And the only payment was a perfect sacrifice. And I can't do that because I'm not perfect and neither are you. But Jesus said, I can do that. And so, and so he died for you. But the story doesn't end there because three days later, that tomb was empty. I don't know how it happened. There's no scientific explanation except to say that God is so powerful that he brings dead things to life. And maybe this year, something in your life has felt dead and broken and, and dormant and, and there's, no, there's no life in it. And you know what? We have a God who specializes in breathing life into that stuff. And so in this moment and in the time that you spend with him, ask him to breathe life into those things. That's what this is all about. And then just give him praise and give him glory for the fact that he loves you enough to offer you that gift. Jesus, thank you so much for that love and for your grace. My prayer for everybody who's listening right now, God, is that you would give us the, uh, give us the determination and the focus and the courage to burn whatever ships we have to burn, to, to blaze through distractions and excuses and control issues or conflicts or whatever the case may be so that nothing stands between us and Jesus. And God, my prayer for our church this year is that we would take this seriously because if we will each as individuals invest in our faith, I believe as a church, we will become stronger in our impact in our community and for your kingdom will become greater. And the things that you wanna do, the ways that you wanna work are just as miraculous as the miracles Jesus performed. And we will get to see it firsthand, God, because you're faithful and you're good. And I know that it starts when we take our faith seriously and we invest in it. So would you help us to do that, to be determined? God, we're so thankful for Jesus and for the cross and for the empty tomb. And in this moment, we thank you for that. We give you praise. And God, we say thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.